Love music, don't you? Not what we do without music. It's a wonderful thing, especially when it's used in honor and glory of our Lord. Today we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, or no, no, not John, Luke. Let me get the right book. Luke chapter 23, although this story is in John also, the crucifixion of Jesus. But there's something in Luke that's not in the other Gospels, and that is the conversation that took place between the thief on the cross and Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, we're going to pick it up at verse 32 and go down through verse 43. So we can get those verses on the screen for me. I could use my hard copy. Do we have those verses available? Uh, yeah. Luke 23, verse 32. I do have a real Bible, too. <coughs> In Luke 23, it says that there were also two others, male factors, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, to be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription was written over the him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, saying, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, the cross of Jesus Christ evokes different responses from different people. Some people, for example, respond very favorably to the cross of the Lord, while others respond very unfavorably. For example, when Jesus hung in agony upon the cross that day, the Bible says that many people in the crowd ridiculed him and jeered at him and said, if you are the Christ, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you really are who you say you are. Meanwhile, a centurion who was watching the same events unfold <clears throat> looked up at Jesus and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Same event, but totally different responses. Some people accepted Christ, and some people rejected it. It's been said that the cross is both repelling and compelling at the same time. That is, it's compelling in the sense that many people are drawn toward the cross. They're attracted to the love and the mercy and grace that is displayed in the Lord Jesus on the cross. And so they're compelled to come to the cross and to worship the Lord and to glorify Him and to follow Him. But then others are repelled by it. They look at the cross and, and they turn away. They look at the cross and they turn away in disgust. Some people in anger because they have this hatred even of the Lord Jesus. Many people turn away in indifference. And the scriptures tell us that it would be this way. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, the Bible says that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to those who are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. It's the same cross, but different responses. To some people, it's utter foolishness. 
and they call it a fairy tale or a myth. To others, it's the power of salvation. It's the power of the gospel. And probably nowhere is this more readily seen than right here in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, where we have three crosses on Calvary's hill with Jesus in the middle, and you have one thief rejecting Jesus and the other thief accepting him. And so you have here one person who's turning away from the Lord Jesus, not literally, but figuratively in his heart, and the other one who is receiving him. You have one man who's dying in his sins. You have one man who's dying to his sins. And then one, Jesus, who's dying for our sins. Somebody pointed out that you have a dying sinner, a dying saint, and a dying Savior. Or to put it one more way, you have a cross of rejection, a cross of reception, and a cross of redemption. And we're going to look at each one of those crosses this morning and look at what they mean to us and where we are in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first cross is the cross of rejection. This is the thief on the cross who railed on Jesus, the one who mocked Jesus, the one who was actually rebuked by the other thief, interestingly enough, and he rejected Christ from his life. And as far as we know, this man continued to reject Jesus and went to hell forever. This is the cost of rejection. Rejecting Jesus costs a person his or her soul. It's very important to understand that all that is necessary for you or for me or for anyone else to go to hell forever and to miss heaven is the simple rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ from your life. The simple refusal to allow the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be your Savior. See, a lot of people seem to have the idea that hell is reserved just for the worst of mankind. That you have to go out and commit some heinous crime, that you need to be a murderer or some kind of vile criminal, that hell is only for those who are the worst of the worst. And that all other decent human beings will go to heaven. That seems to be the, the thought of a great many people. And yet the scriptures teach that the simple neglect or refusal to ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your life for the forgiveness of sin is cause enough to go to hell because our sin has separated us from God. And the only way for that chasm to be bridged is through the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus at Calvary. Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48 that he who rejects me will be judged in that day. And understand that if you refuse Jesus from your life, you are pushing aside the only one, the only one who could ever save your soul. God has not given us a list of options. He didn't say if you push aside Jesus, there's always Buddha and there's always Muhammad or there's some other new age type of religion that can get you forgiveness. This is the only option we have because every other way is false. And Jesus is the only Savior. He is the only true God. He is the only one who can wash away our sins. At one point, there was a renowned surgeon in the city of Chicago by the name of Dr. Leo Winters. And he got a phone call in the middle of the night around 1 o'clock in the morning because an emergency had come up at the hospital and a boy had been involved in a terrible automobile accident. Dr. Winters was surprised to get the call because he wasn't on call that night, but they explained to him that the boy's injuries were such that he was probably the only doctor in the whole area that had the skill and the know-how to save this boy's life. And so, of course, he said he'd get to the hospital as soon as he possibly could. He changed clothes and got in his car. The quickest route to the hospital was through a rather rough neighborhood, and ordinarily he didn't go that way, but given the circumstances, he decided to travel through that neighborhood. And 
As he sat at one traffic light, a man wearing a ball cap and a dirty flannel shirt forced his way into his vehicle and grabbed Dr. Winters by the car and threw him out of his vehicle and said, I've got to have this car. And the man took off and left Dr. Winters there without a vehicle. The doctor wandered around for 45 minutes trying to find some way to get to the hospital. And finally, when he was able to get there, an hour or more had passed. And of course, he rushed to the nurse's station, but the nurse who met him there was shaking her head and said that the boy had died about a half an hour or so before. The doctor asked about the boy's family. And the nurse said that his father had gotten here right before the boy died. He was down in the chapel. And she said he's confused. He couldn't understand why he never showed up, you know. And he didn't bother to explain it at the moment, but he went on down to the chapel. And when he got there, he saw that same man, the man with the baseball cap and the dirty flannel shirt that had taken his car earlier that night. And what that father didn't know is that he had thrown from his life the only person that could have saved his boy that night. And you realize if you say no to Jesus, if you toss him out of your life, if you refuse his offer of salvation, that you are tossing aside the only one who could save your soul. There's not another option that's going to reveal itself later on. There's not another exit you're going to be able to find at the last minute. Jesus is the only one who can save your soul. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So this thief on the cross represents the cross of rejection. And don't reject Jesus from your life. Every single person needs the Lord Jesus and his forgiveness. And if you want to go to heaven, when this life is over, you need Christ. So don't reject him from your life. The second cross is the cross of reception. This is the thief who looked over at Jesus and rebuked the other thief. He said to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus told him today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the cross of reception. Now, the word reception, of course, has to do with receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Reception and receive basically come from the same word. It's like with an antenna, if you're looking for good reception, it's because it's receiving the signal. Or for you sports fans, a wide receiver makes receptions, right? How many receptions did the receiver have today? Those words are come from the same word. And so receiver and reception come from the same word. So when we talk about a cross of reception... We're talking about a person who has received the Lord Jesus into his life, who's asked the Lord to forgive him of his sins and to be his Savior. Now, it would be surprising to some, and it would make sense in some ways, but our God's greater than this, that some people might would expect God to say that if we're going to go to heaven, we have to do something remarkable. Yeah, this is where God's grace comes in. Because what if God had said, well, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to do something like climb Mount Everest or swim from Florida to Cuba or to walk the distance of the United States from Los Angeles to New York um, and to do so without getting mugged, which wouldn't matter if you were Pastor John because he never has any cash on him. But that's another matter altogether. You never want to mug him because he never has any cash. <laughs> but I've got to pick on the younger generation, you know. But you know, if God had said, you got to do something totally remarkable, totally, some physical feat that let's say only a handful of people could do, well, that would exclude so many. Because most people could never climb Mount Everest. Most people could never swim from Florida to Cuba. And there would be so many things that many of us could never do. And so it would exclude a great number of people. Never mind the fact that those things could never pay for sin. But what I'm saying is that God has said, I'm going to make it very straightforward. And to where it's totally separated from human accomplishment. Because our accomplishment could never save us anyway. And so Jesus paid the price for us and made salvation by grace. And in, a, in essence, made it very simple. 
Very simple. In fact, you want to know how simple Jesus made it for us? He made it so simple that he said that salvation is like walking through a door. Because he said, I am the door into the sheepfold. That we're to enter through Jesus. He said, salvation basically is as simple as walking through a door. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it today, but you have walked through probably two or three dozen doors already this morning. Because you'd be surprised how many doors you have in your home. You know, doorways, you go into the bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, all these different doorways. And then you get it in your car door, you go through the door to get in your car, and there are doorways to it. Yeah, you get to go through a doorway to get into this church this morning. And I didn't see any of you stop at the door and say, now, how does this thing work anyway? You know? You don't stop at the door of your house and say, now, do I turn the doorknob this way or that way? How does this thing work? I don't understand how these things function. You don't do that. Why not? Because walking through a door is very easy. In fact, it's so easy that when you pull on a door that you're supposed to push on, you feel like an idiot, don't you? You know, I hope nobody saw that because you feel so stupid because walking through a door is one of the easiest things we do. And Jesus said, getting saved is just as simple as walking through a door. He said, I am the door to the sheepfold. And we just walk through and get saved. He also said that it's as easy, as simple as taking a drink of water. He said, he is the living water. And if we take of him, we will never thirst again. If somebody sits a glass of water in front of you, you don't sit there and look at it and say... Okay, where are the directions? Because you've taken thousands of drinks of water in your day. And it's very simple, right? Jesus said getting saved is just like taking a drink of water. Because he's the living water. Aren't you glad that by the grace of God, he has made it to where all the human race, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord can receive him as Savior? You don't have to have a certain IQ. You don't have to have a certain amount of money in your bank account. You don't have to live in a certain neighborhood or drive a certain car. You don't have to have a certain color of hair or a certain color of skin. That all people everywhere, of every nation and race and tongue, can be saved under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I praise the Lord for that, His mighty grace. And so receive Him. Don't think you're ever excluded. You know, sometimes people say, well, I've just sinned too much to be forgiven. Or you don't know all the things that I've done. God's grace knows no bounds. And He will forgive you of all your sins and be your Savior when you call upon Him. Well, the third cross, of course, is the cross of Jesus, which is the cross of redemption. The cross of redemption. Redemption has to do with buying back, with purchasing. There's a transaction. We sometimes talk about a transaction that takes place at Calvary. When we sinned, in essence, the devil stole our souls from us. We gave it up willingly, I know. But when Jesus died, he purchased. Our salvation by paying the greatest price that could be paid, the blood of his own son. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, it says that we have not been redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Jesus is the purchase price that God paid for your salvation and for mine. Don't let that blood be spilled in vain because that blood was shed for you that you would be redeemed, forgiven, bought back and be God's possession. That's why he died in your place. You remember in the Old Testament when Absalom was killed and news came to King David, Absalom's father, and we get such a, 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 a clear picture of David's sorrow when he said, Oh, my son, Absalom. My son, my son. Would that I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Well, it was probably 30 years ago, someone loaned me a book where this writer, and I can't even remember his name, wrote a paragraph about this that I kept because I thought it was very insightful. Referring to David's loss of his son where he said, would that I had died 
instead of you. What David's saying is, I wish I could have died in your place. I wish it would have been me so that you could have lived. And here's what the writer said. Listen. David meant it, of course. If he could have done the boys dying for him, he would have done it. If he could have paid the price of his son's betrayal of him, he would have paid it. If he could have given his life that Absalom could have lived, he would have given it. But not even a king could do that. As history would later show, it takes a God. I've always liked that. Because the writer said no matter how much David would have wanted to, even though he was the most powerful man in Israel, he could not give his life to make his son live again. A king can't do that. But a God can. And that's exactly what God did. God gave his life on the cross to pay for our betrayal of him. God gave his life on the cross so that you and I could live. It's the greatest story that's ever been told. It's the greatest news the world has ever heard. Calvary's Hill is the place where the greatest event that coupled with the resurrection of Jesus took place. It was there that the price was paid for your salvation and mine. And if you haven't received Jesus as your Savior today, my prayer and God's longing is for you to come to Him today. The Bible says that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but He wants everyone to come to repentance. So if you haven't received Jesus today, would you repent of your sins before God? And ask Him to forgive you and receive Him as your Savior. And He will receive you just as readily as He received that thief on the cross. And He'll make you a part of His family. Let's stand together as we pray.